Welcome to The Happy Doc, the voice of fulfilled physicians. This show is about bringing inspirational, creative, successful, and happy health professionals to you. Get ready to learn how you can be a happy doctor too. Hey guys, I'm really excited to introduce our next guest, Dr. Venu and Vinay Julapali. And a little bit about them first off. Dr. Venu is a gastroenterologist that works in private practice. And Dr. Vinay Julapali is an interventional cardiologist also in private practice. It's really great to learn from these individuals because they are the creators of Healthcare 3.0. And if you haven't heard about this concept and the tenets behind it, I highly recommend you check out their website, conscious-medicine.com, and you're going to learn about the framework of Healthcare 3.0 and what that is. This is literally the evolution of medicine. This is the evolution of healthcare, and it's really exciting to learn about these concepts because it gave me personally the energy to be really excited about the future of medicine and how we can co-create it together. So guys, I hope you enjoy this conversation. We learn about the tenets of Healthcare 3.0 and these physicians that we have with us have an amazing energy that I'm sure will inspire you this week. Enjoy the episode. Hello everyone, this is Taylor and this is another episode of the Happy Doc. Um, I am so excited for our next guests here. We have two guests um, it's Dr. Venu and Dr. Vinay, and they'll pronounce their full names here. Um, they're amazing guests that we have coming up, and they have a website called Conscious Medicine, and I want you guys to definitely check that out. Um, I'm not going to prolong the introduction here, so Venu and Vinay, can you introduce yourselves? Sure. My name is Venu Julapali. I'm uh, the younger brother. Uh, I'm a gastroenterologist. I've been in solo practice for almost 12 years now in Houston, Texas, and um, we can get into more about what I do. And I'm Vinay awesome. Gilipali. Uh, I am an interventional cardiologist who was in a traditional practice when I first got out of fellowship about eight, nine years ago, and due to different circumstances, had to create my own practice, and now I'm a solo interventional cardiologist, not, not many of those, who runs kind of a micro practice. Wow. Well, and I'm sure we can learn a lot more about what you guys do specifically. Um, so just as an introductory question to get to know you guys a little bit more, um, I like to ask, why, why did you begin medicine? And what was, you know, what was the core reason why you started this process in the first place? I mean, you're talking to two Indians, so is there another choice besides medicine or engineering? <laughs> 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 I mean, okay. it, it was pretty, uh, I mean, my parents have, uh, came from uh, uh, the late 60s, 70s. They came into India, I mean, from India to um, New York. My dad's a doctor. And my mom took care of us rugrats. And really, I mean, I, there's nothing inspiring about what I would say in the sense that, like, you know, when you're growing up as an Indian American of, of, with parents of that generation, you're pretty much uh, told to be either a doctor or an engineer. So it's that's kind of how it started for me. Um, obviously, uh, I wouldn't be in it if that was the only reason I was doing medicine now. But uh, it's a secure field um, that gives us a living, and so that's kind that's pretty much how it started for me. Yeah, and I, I'd echo that. And I think you know a lot of it just came indirectly. I absorbed a lot of it seeing my dad, who's a, who's also a cardiologist, and his training. And he did he actually did pediatrics first, and then internal medicine after that. Just watching him every day, seeing what he was doing, you know, it does tend to kind of inspire you that this is an honorable type of field, and it's one that you can make some good uh, good living with. And so, yeah, I, I think I indirectly kind of through osmosis absorbed that this is one of the fields that I should uh, look into after college. And, but during the first two years of my college, actually, I thought I was going to be an engineer. I, I majored a lot in electrical engineering type of work, uh, physics, math, and then transitioned over to uh, medicine. And nowadays, it's actually, if I had to do it over again, I might have actually finished out those degrees and then still gone into medicine. It was a little harder back then to to do those kind of degrees and get into medicine if not if you didn't have previous work experience. But uh, it's you know that that's how I fell into medicine. 
Wow. Well, you know, it, it might not be the most inspiring story, but you guys definitely um, are in the right field. And I can say that without a doubt, looking at the website that you guys have created. And so I would like us to um, kind of steer this converse, conversation towards a little bit about your experiences in medical school uh, training and your times as a physician, practicing attending physicians, and how that's led to you, you talking about conscious medicine. Yeah, so I guess I'll start. I mean, I, I've had an experience that's similar to some of the other guests that have been on your podcast in the sense that when I got out of college and got into medical school, I mean, I, I'd say I like to joke that my peak intellect was uh, probably third year of college, and then and then it just went downhill from there. <laughs> okay. um, because medical school has a tendency, because of all the rote memorization that you're asked to do, to kind of dumb you down. Um, I enjoyed my basic sciences um, in medical school. I, I liked the the subject matter, and I when I got into um, the, the clinics, the wards, which was, you know, two and a half years in, in my medical school, I mean, I got very dis- disillusioned. I mean, I, I, I was like, this is it. I mean, waking up at four in the morning, getting berated by an OB-GYN resident. I, I really was not liking life at that time. And I just wasn't liking anything that I was uh, rotating through. And, uh, you know, I have this theory that everybody goes through this mid med medical school crisis. M- mine happened to come right when I hit the wards, and I was gonna just, I was gonna finish my MD and go on to law school because I just couldn't do this anymore. So, so that was a serious consideration of mine. But then I realized, well, I got to take the LSAT, I got to write a bunch of essays, and I wasn't really into that at that time. Although things have changed now, um, so. So, so I came upon internal medicine, and I and I and, and I like that uh, relative to the other things. It was all relative, um, and, and then I got out. I got out into residency. I chose internal medicine, and I and I got into the, into the residency lifestyle, and uh, it was great. I mean, my residency was really difficult. Uh, we had a pretty malignant residency where I went uh, at Baylor uh, in Houston, um, but it really taught us very well. And I got out of residency, and um, I went straight into solo practice as a gastro well, after fellowship. I went straight into solo practice as a gastroenterologist because I had a, um, a you know a nice um, setup in the sense that my dad was a physician, so um, he through his network was able to get me started, um, which was invaluable. So I could start as a solo guy. Um, and then I got another like second stage of disillusionment of all the stuff that I was seeing in the healthcare space in the private world, which is in the academic world as well. But I got a firsthand experience of the, of the craziness that goes on. And to me, it was like, it was like I was in the matrix and I was uh, looking around me and everybody was going around like everything was normal. And I, you know, I just decided to, t- to take the red pill and I unplugged. That's my story in a nutshell. How about you? Yeah, uh, I mean, I had a I had a difficult medical school. Also, it wasn't I was never a memorizer. I was always a conceptualizer. So, a lot of those first two years, like uh, Venus said, was just to me very very difficult memorizing things. Uh, as I got into third year, fourth year, things did improve. I, I enjoyed the patient interaction, and residency was actually not too bad for me. Uh, the hours are, were of course brutal. We didn't have the work limits and all those, but I, I, I tended to thrive because I was seeing people and seeing patients and not just memorizing things. And fellowship, similar, similarly, was uh, also very uh, challenging, uh, but, but again, you know, intellectually very satisfying. When I got into my first pri- uh, private practice and I joined the group, that's when a lot of my disillusion- disillusionment came and sort of my crisis came. I, you know, uh, there were things that, uh, that we were doing during residency and fellowship that you know, we, we try to do things the right way, you know, not order too many tests, uh, do, you know, reason things out, try to get to diagnoses. And then when I came into private practice, that, that whole thing just was completely gone. It was just a factory type of thing, order stress tests every day, order echoes, do this, do that. There was really no more thinking process behind it. It was very business oriented. And so I got very quickly disillusioned that I didn't learn, you know, did I learn all this cardiology just to practice as if this is just a business. And so I had to, I, I eventually went out on my own and started practicing the way I wanted to with a, a limited 
much more limited uh, patient panel, and really ordering things, you know, when they needed to be ordered and doing things when they need to be done, but not doing them also when they didn't have to be done, which I didn't have that freedom in my earlier group practice. And so I've been very happy the last couple of years. Of course, you know, a lot of things that we call Health 2.0 have, have made doctors and physicians' life difficult, but we're, we're working on those things. But overall, running this micro practice, I've, I've been much, much more gratifying. It's, it has been much, much more gratifying. Awesome. And uh, guys, I appreciate you so much for, for being with me today. I'm sure we're going to learn a lot. Um, and so I wanted to poke in a little bit to what both of you stated. You talked about this sense of disillusionment within medicine, and I'm sure there's many, many, many individuals who are listening in that uh, probably feel the same way. So could you guys give me um, just reflecting on your experiences? Let's not break HIPAA here or anything, but uh, could you reflect on maybe an example of a, a time where this disillusionment really was at play and uh, what you would have done differently, um, maybe on a on a personal level, with that example. Uh, I, I have plenty of those examples. As a as a specialist, a lot of my uh, patients, when I first see them, are, are essentially referrals. So I'd often get, you know, thirty year old, forty year old patients who come in chest pain that, you know, by all my training, I would know that this was very atypical. This is not cardiac chest pain. If I was in residency and fellowship, maybe I'd get an echocardiogram, and, and that would be the end of it. But as I, as I said before, if I didn't order an echo, a stress, do a full workup, then it almost felt like the person who referred to me would be like, then why did I send them to you? That's the reason I sent them to you. So there's always this, this conflict of how much to do, and if I don't do enough, they're not going to send me more. And it was just, just this cognitive dissonance of, I, I've got to do right by the patient, but then I can't build my practice and don't and can't do right by the group if I don't do the standard cardiology workups. So, you know, that, I have numerous examples that it would happen week after week after week, which is why it led to a lot of my disillusion, disillusionment about cardiology, how it's actually practiced in the in the in the world. Yeah, I'll just dovetail off of that. I mean, it's it's kind of unique to us um, in the sense that you know, for those of y'all who are listening who are thinking about subspecializing. He's a, he's a cardiologist, I'm a gastroenterologist. When you're in those kinds of fields, I mean, you're I mean, if you're in a traditional practice, you're in you're at the mercy essentially of the people who refer to you. So so you have to kind of cater to their ideas of what you should be. So for me, the the major disillusionment was just me having to play the persona of the nice satisfying gastroenterologist who's going to bend over backwards for the referring physician. N- not that they're all evil or mean, but there's this there's this identity that's laid on you as a as a subspecialist that is attached to their version of what you ought to be doing and that started to really stifle me. Wow. Wow. Yeah, and uh I mean there's plenty of examples um, that I'm, I'm sure uh, our listeners can pull up. And actually, that would be interesting um, for any listener that's you know taking this in right now. Uh, that'd be great later if you guys could post some examples online and share of similar instances. But I, I'm sure you know many people have felt the same way. So now I would like us to move towards understanding how we get away from that disillusionment and what you guys are aspiring to create with conscious medicine. Can you explain a little bit about what conscious medicine is, getting into healthcare 3.0, and maybe some of the ideas are the tenets of the philosophy? Yeah, I mean, we can go for hours on this. I know, not, not too deep, but you know, just some of the, the concepts that people could get Yeah, at. absolutely. Yeah, let me just present a brief summary. So, in essence, I mean, conscious medicine is just sort of a distilled version of what uh, larger stuff that we want to be uh, talking about. 
uh, in the world. In conscious really refers to waking up. So, you know, I use the matrix analogy. I love the matrix. Um, it, it is my go-to analogy for this. So in some sense, it's how do you wake up from this matrix of the American healthcare system, uh, both as a patient as well as a, as a healthcare professional. So on the healthcare professional side, it's it, conscious medicine is really a lot about waking up, waking up to how the medical system really works, the inside game that goes on between hospital systems, insurance companies, uh, and, and it's really about how we, as a collective system, can wake up. And then on the individual sense, it's about how each of us individually wakes up to show up in this uh, world in a new way. And in that sense, it's, very, it's a very entrepreneurial move. I mean, one of the things that I, I, I came to realize about my, my own self and my path in medicine is that uh, you know, f- for me and for many others in, in traditional medicine, medicine is very not entrepreneurial. So you, you're, and by entrepreneurial, I don't mean just making money. I mean the creative juice that an entrepreneur entrepreneur puts out into the world to create something of his or her own that provides value to the world. That kind of that kind of move, that kind of aliveness, is is, is something that I believe traditional medicine sorely lacks. So bring, conscious medicine is in large part about bringing, bat, bringing that online and alive in you. And that's really what this thing we call Health 3.0 is about, which is, which is really, it's a distillation of um, this concept and framework that we've been uh, putting together called unique self-medicine or unique self and the future of medicine. I can get into a, a bit later what unique self is, but... Health 3.0 was our way of distilling it down. And it, it helps to go over like where that came from. So for us, like we went to these, uh, there's these meetups that are called Health 2.0 uh, that, that are around the, the country. And so we went to one of these things in Houston and you know, it was just all about tech and how tech can improve our world and, and medicine and make us all feel good about ourselves. And that's not what we were experiencing in, re, in the real world of medicine. The tech was actually making things work worse because the people who were putting out the tech were clueless about how the tech could actually affect patient care. So in that moment, I think it was my brother who just said, like, we don't need a health 2.0, we need a health 3.0. We need something that actually reconnects the humanity of what it is that we do. I mean, medicine is a, it's like, it's, it's the field that perhaps has the most humanity in it in terms of the way we connect and engage and touch the patient's lives. So for tech to be useful, it has to facilitate that. And if you can't do that, then you've got nothing. You, me, medicine's entire foundation is destroyed without it. So for us, that was, that was the beginning of how what Health 3.0 meant to us. Health 1.0 was where we used to be. Where, and the, the best way I, I like to kind of summarize it is Health 1.0, you can say, is separate. So it was, the, it was kind of the, 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 the beginning of the era of modern medicine, very independent, very autonomous, Think like Marcus Welby, MD, going out, making house calls, knowing everybody, very intimate, very personal, did whatever he wanted to do. Nobody was telling him what to do. All fee for service, no no guidelines, no algorithms, no standards, really. Um, And there were many benefits of that, of course, because of the autonomy. But then what was what was the weaknesses of 1.0 was that it wasn't going to sustain us. I mean, if you just do everything uh, uh, the way you want it, anecdotally, fee for service, not have an idea about value, it's not really sustainable. It makes the whole thing go bankrupt. So Health 2.0 was, in effect, a response to that, that, wait a minute, there, there has to be a way of standardizing care, uh, practice medicine on the basis of evidence, uh, homogenize it to, to, to the extent that you can kind of predict with, with a greater degree um, how medicine can be practiced, which then potentially makes medicine more cost effective. So, so that was the move that really came in, which we, we, which we kind of lump into, into Health 2.0. Great on paper. And the, and the way I summarize Health 2.0 is Health 2.0 is whole. So it's all about systems, integration, seeing the entire healthcare system not as a fragmented jumble of 
independently practicing healthcare professionals, but as an integrated system where everything is interconnected and dependent upon one another. Um, so, so the ideal of that is keep the whole healthy. Sounds great, excellent, but the thing that starts to go by the wayside when you, when you have Health 2.0 being just whole and integrated is you lose your own voice. So, the, so your unique voice starts to get lost. So you essentially, as a healthcare professional and as a patient, I might add, you start to be treated as a commodity in a machine. You, you actually begin to go into a matrix where everything is just commoditized and you're like a battery that's, that's, that's fueling some other, something else that's external to you. So in response to that, Health 3.0 is unique. That's the key word. And by unique, I, I don't mean separate. So the difference between uniqueness and separateness is separateness doesn't fit itself into, into a puzzle. It doesn't fit in, it, itself into the whole. Uniqueness consciously knows that we are all interconnected. We're all part of this wonderful, beautiful whole. And the way I actually make that whole come alive and evolve is to celebrate my uniqueness. It's actually to, that I can fit in better into the puzzle when I actually express my uniqueness to the best of my ability. So now I reconnect back with who it is that I am deep down. And so I practice medicine in a way that is unique to me, while at the same time recognizing that I am interconnected with the, with the whole system. That's the essence of Health 3.0. Wow, that was uh, an amazing summary, and uh, I absolutely love you know thinking about it almost historically that progression, you know from like I was talk- talking about Doctor Welby and the personal uh, personalized system, which you know people can say you know something along the lines of pseudoscience, then us coming together as a whole, and then uh, you know us seeing the issues with that in terms of standardization. And then moving forward, where we have our uniqueness uh, amongst the medical standard medical practice, and how that ends up showing up ultimately in the world. And I was looking at your website, and um, there's a quote in here. Maybe you guys can uh, reflect on it a little bit. Um, and I really loved it, so I just wanted to say it is the. It says the illusion that science can provide some objective answer that applies to everyone is a special danger. Um, and I really love that from the site, and I think that's something that maybe really fits in with the idea of 3.0. Could you uh, discuss that a little bit? Yeah, let me let me also add to uh, kind of give a heuristic. Uh, Vayner did a good explanation of it, uh, describing the theory and the evolution of 1.0 to 2.0, 3.0. A good heuristic that I use is, and oftentimes this is uh, not understood properly, but. 1.0 it wasn't necessarily a good or a bad thing, nor was 2.0, and nor will be 3.0. It, it's, it's more of an evolution. For example, in 1.0, the creative energies of 1.0 led to a lot of discoveries. We wouldn't have bypass surgery if not for 1.0 medicine, that individu- individualistic uh, attempt to try to expand the frontiers of medicine and often do it in, in very non-scientific ways. Uh, I mean, when DeBakey did the first uh, heart surgery, he just thought up, he used to, he knew sewing from his mother was practicing grafts. He went and got some Dacron grafts and just said, hey, this might work. That could never even occur in a 2.0 system right now. Uh, in, a, in discovering antibiotics for infectious disease, the first catheterization, uh, talk about skin in the game, uh, Grunzig, I believe, catheterized himself at some point. So those are all kind of 1.0 discoveries that led to all the modern advances of medicine, which would never happen in a 2.0. So 3.0s needs to reintegrate that creativity, that 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 uh, naivety, uh, that wanting to discover the the new advances of medicine, and then put it back into have it in a framework of 2.0, have the guidelines there, have the evidence there, uh, have the trials there, and then that's when 3.0 could be successful to reintegrate those two. Not a good, bad thing. There will be good and bad in 3.02, but when you start to kind of grok this, you start to see that a practice could be 3.0, not that 
it doesn't make mistakes in the practice, but it includes the creativity of 1.0 along with the evidence base of 2.0. That's how I like to think of it. And a, and a shorthand is 1.0 had the heart. Marcus Welby, you'd go out, make house calls. Sometimes if you couldn't pay as a patient, you'd give him a chicken or some eggs or whatever way you could make up the value that he was providing you. That was pure heart, heartful medicine. 2.0 brought in the brain, you know, the organization, the, the business aspects, the need to make this financially solvent, uh, trying to make sure that care doesn't destroy the system uh, of, a, of a nation. So, and then, so that's the brain. And then 3.0 integrates the heart and the brain again. You got to have both, not a good or a bad thing. Yeah, and to get back to that quote, I mean, I, I like to say that uh, Health 3.0 is evidence in, uh, is evidence informed, not evidence enslaved. So, you know, 1.0 was evidence ignorant. So medicine is being practiced anecdotally. Uh, evidence evidence based is 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 the the epitome of Health 2.0. In 3.0, we're evidence-informed, but we're not evidence-enslaved. So I can't tell you how many times I'm in a situation where I am looking at a patient, a unique patient in a unique situation with a unique scenario, and I am... I am using the evidence to inform me about how to handle that patient, but then ultimately, it's an N equals one situation. Where that rubber meets the road, I am deciding in that unique situation what is needed there. So I may not follow the evident, what the algorithm or the cookbook or the evidence says or what some administrator is, is metricizing me on because that's not what medicine calls for in that moment. That's the difference. Yeah, and, and, I, and I think, you know, when I'm thinking back to reading studies, um, a lot of times you might find a study that kind of applies to the patient in front of you, but, you know, that patient has different demographics, different genetic backgrounds, different comorbidities and diseases. So in some ways, it, it is kind of impossible to completely be able to use the evidence directly on that patient. So I, I definitely... Uh, can understand, and I'm sure I'm going to learn a lot more as I'm going along my medical career and uh, seeing more patients. Um, so, this topic is something that's definitely not spoken about. And I, first off, I think this should be required in medical education to understand these tenets because I think it's uh, beautifully stated and something that we should start to spread definitely. Um, what are some of the views you've been hearing? from other physicians and healthcare providers about healthcare 3.0 and what you guys have been doing with conscious medicine. Has the overall vibe or conversation been positive, negative? What have people been saying about what you're doing? Yeah, I'd say overall has been positive. I mean, the way that this really took off, we, we kind of laid the framework and then, uh, Zubin Demania, AKA Z dog MD, um, we were having a conversation with, with him once and we were like, I was like, Hey, you know, you're going out on the, on the circuit, why don't you test drive this and see how it plays? I mean, you know, a framework is only good as as good as its ability to connect with the people that you want to impact. So I said, test drive this uh, this trifecta framework and see how it plays. So he started doing it on on the circuit, and it it worked. Uh, with the with the medical groups that he was speaking with, you know, then he got on Facebook and then and then started uh, really promoting the the framework and it and then it blew up, uh, and now of course there's you know Facebook groups devoted to this and so that's really the the, the short history of the takeoff of Health 3.0 and I think one of the one of the things that I've been pleasantly happy with at the early stages of this, and I, and I want to emphasize, I think we're at the very early stages of what this is all about. And we're, of course, not the only ones that are going to be informing what Health 3.0 really is. We're just laying the framework, and then other people are going to build on it. Uh, it's, 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 it's what I call transpartisan. So, I mean, in this, in this current climate of, you know, Obamacare, uh, uh, Senate and the House now looking to repeal and replace. I mean, this is this topic can be very political, right? The thing that I've found about Health 3.0 framework is that it's able to actually cross the lines. It 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 has a transpartisan uh, bent to it, where I can talk about this to a person on the left or a person on the right, and and they they'll accept it. So nobody is rejecting it outright on the basis of partisanship. And I use transpartisan, transpartisan specifically because, like, 
nonpartisan is kind of this to me like this kind of like triangulated, compromised kind of mush. Whereas transpartisan is, it, it's actually like at times health 3.0 is very right. It's like very conservative uh, medicine. And at times health 3.0 is very leftist. So, so in, in the, in the transpartisan uh, way of looking at it, it doesn't matter. Because ultimately, I always come back to where the rubber meets the road. What is the best way that we as healthcare professionals can connect and interact and really heal a person who's sitting in our room. That's ultimately what medicine is about. So throw out all the politics. Um, If you get that part solid, like that's the success of Health 3.0. And I think that's what people are seeing uh, about it thus far. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. And I I love that that final point you made. And I, I very much so resonate with that point is the the concept of Take out all of these sides to the story. Um, how do I heal to the best of my ability the person in front of me? Um, that's that's an awesome point and something I, I definitely wanted to highlight from that portion. So, you know, I, just so you guys know, I mean, I'm going into my intern year, so I'm st- I'm literally starting now. You guys know that you know July first. That's the time that all the interns start. So. Someone like me, you know, who's going through medicine and there's going to be, obviously I'm going to have to learn the algo- algorithms and the standard, uh, standard care for different disease processes. How does someone like me or a medical student, someone early in training who wants to help in this kind of vision, 3.0, uh, kind of a bigger perspective, but still is, quote, stuck in a different position, how do we take some personal ownership and start to develop uh, this, vi- this greater vision of healthcare 3.0? Well, your life, as you know, it is basically over. That's the first thing <laughs> to say. <laughs> He's speechless. <laughs> like, I don't know how to react no. to that. <laughs> no, no. So here's what I would say. So, so, I mean, it's all about love and humanity. I mean, that's the driving currency of everything that we talk about. So when you're an intern, of course, it's really hard to kind of connect with that because you're just so busy and you don't have sleep and you're literally, well, not literally, but you're drowning and you don't even know it until you actually kind of get an hour and gasp for air because now you realize you've been underwater all along. So all that being said, don't ever lose your humanity. So, so while the center of gravity pulls that uh, back toward going underwater, just connect, 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 connect. If there's one word that I would say in terms of how somebody who's coming out of medical school and getting into a, a, a residency can engage with the ethos of Health 3.0, it is to connect. Connect with your patient, connect with yourself, connect with your family, Connect with what it is to be a human being, to be alive, because that aliveness is what makes you who you uniquely are. And if you don't have that aliveness, you know, there's a lot of talk about burnout. Your podcasts have had that as a theme in many of the, of the sessions. If you don't, if you don't, if you're not alive, if you're not crackling with the, with the, with the eros of aliveness, that will translate to burnout, Right. That ultimately, that's what burnout is about to me. N- not having aliveness, not having the platonic eros like coursing through your blood. If if you begin to lose that, either find that in yourself and check back in with yourself, or create a support system around you to where if that's a blind spot for you, that someone else is going to say, "Hey, man." you know you need to reconnect so you need to have either either do it on your with yourself if you can or better yet create a little community that sees that in you when it possibly inevitably happens yeah and i I just add to that that you know always retain that creativity always challenge if something's being done because it's always been done that way doesn't mean it can't change. And, and I remember just a very, very small example of this when I was in, uh, uh, had just finished residency and I was going into fellowship and my brother was, uh, I think, in the second year of residency in a similar system, di- different hospital, but in the same uh, county system. And 
I was just relating to him a story about, you know, yeah, we don't draw blood. And in his hospital, they, they did. All the interns were forced to draw blood every day, every morning on all the morning labs. And I said, no, we don't do that. And he said he couldn't believe it. We're the same system, except in our hospital, it's always been tradition that we had to draw the blood and not the phlebotomists. I, I don't know what the phlebotomists were doing in that hospital, but apparently the interns drew all the blood. They, were, they weren't there. <laughs> so he... After he realized that I didn't do that in our system, he went over to his. He, he, he had a proposal written, and he said, you know, this is kind of dangerous, actually, for patient care, that we should be learning, we should be doing other functions of, of internship. And, and, and he pointed to my hospital in his example. Well, with, it took a while, but within six months, that whole policy changed. So something, I, I look back now and I go, all the students who are now, <laughs> you know, going through that training the last 10 years, it was that little thing that my brother took from my example, changed it, and now the whole future of medical students, they can sleep at least an hour or two more. So those little example, those opportunities are there wherever you practice. Challenge, use your creative energy, don't think that things always have to be done the same way. These are things that you should never forget. And, you know, as you go into private practice, as you go into further training, you're going to make these type of discoveries. You're going to make, you're going to keep improving medicine in your own unique way. And I think that's how medicine evolves. It's not following strict algorithms or guidelines. I mean, and in some ways it's actually very e it's easier for you guys uh, because a lot of what I thought the drudgery of residency was having to memorize stuff, having to get pimped the next day, not having to look through all these resources. You know, now we have Google, now we have up to date, now we can search. And we don't really need to store all of that in the brain anymore. If there's some patient case that you come across, you can you can look it up. You can what you what you need more now, what you what need you need to bring back more online is those creative elements and you can now. You have a little more freedom and energy to do that because you don't have to memorize so many things. Those things are look upable. So I think that's the way medicine training is going to change now. And when artificial intelligence comes in and more support comes in, this is just going to get easier and easier. Which is which is why which is why because all that's coming, it's it's way more incumbent on on you as in training and coming out to actually be representing the humanity of what it is that you do versus the you know the diagnostics the algorithms i mean you know an, an ai uh, 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 an ai designed uh, program is going to be doing most of that anyway yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. i mean uh, uh, i love I what love you guys what said, said. Um, um, and, and definitely, definitely first off i want to talk about that specific example with the phlebotomy and everything um, I find that, you know, at our stage of the game, and especially medical students and everything, people tend to be pretty timid about speaking about issues or inefficiencies. So one thing I took away from that is that we should definitely have the courage to speak up. And that's something that we talk about a lot on these uh, episodes. The uh, other thing I wanted to add is exactly right. We have all this information at the uh, ends of our fingertips, so to speak. Everything's on our phone, everything's on the computer. So it, it's definitely a change. I think what we're learning as a class, you know, my class and my years, is less so about memorization. And yeah, memorization is important to a certain extent, but also about health navigation. And that's something that you guys are, are talking about. How do we navigate to the correct information at the right time? Um, to apply to this specific case scenario, um, and that's and that's a really important topic. So I, I thank you guys for for bringing that up. Um, yeah, even on that story, like I mean, like I mean, it's it's no fun. Uh, I, I was I was drawing blood out of temporal veins at like two in the morning, uh, and so it's it's really no fun to be doing that. Um, and yeah. really, what what I realized, like especially after my brother told me what he told me, is like. Is there actually a policy that says that uh, this, the nurses can't do that? Because if you just talk to the nurses, they're like, "No, we don't do that." So, so I, so I was, so I did a little digging, and there, there actually was no policy. It was just, you know, passed down from uh, one generation to the next. So once that was realized that there actually isn't a policy, then things fell through, uh, fell into place pretty quick. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and you see, like, that was just someone taking personal ownership, like you taking personal ownership in that time to just say, like, wait, is this a standard or is this something just a cultural thing here and can we change and make right. it better? And, and you know, those, that's, you know, that's exactly what it is. That's a conscious thought 
uh, this is inefficient, let's change it. Whereas if you kind of go into robot mode and you forget just looking at things as they are, um, if you forget that, then things don't change, and it can ch- not change for years. So um, it's definitely great to you know maintain that creat- creative thought and solution thinking, entrepreneurial mind, and all that stuff we're, we're thinking about. Um, one one thing I wanted to ask you guys, I mean, you, you both are very amazing individuals, and I'm learning a lot as we're, we're talking right now. Um, and I think you guys are inspirations, but who do you find are inspirations to you? What, what, who, who is your biggest inspiration? Who do you learn, learn from? What are resources that you kind of look out to, um, to learn from? So, um, I mean, one of the biggest inspirations for me is, is the guy who's sitting right next to me. I mean, my, my brother, I mean, I don't really tell this to his face, but I guess I can say it on a podcast. Um, just his, his life experiences. I mean, what he's gone through personally, Uh, and I think the biggest thing that I get from watching him is his ability to, to bear, to endure, uh, that, that's a big life skill that, that we all, you know, continue to kind of hone over time, but the, but the ability to bear discomfort, uh, and, and really kind of take a big picture point of view versus kind of getting lost in the weeds, which is so easy to happen, especially if you're in training, um, I got that from him. I continue to get that from him. So that, you know, that's a very personal uh, uh, point of inspiration. In terms of resources, I mean, one of the things that really got us down this path is we're voracious readers. So, I mean, really, honestly, this path did not begin in medicine for for me. This path began in philosophy, spirituality, uh, bringing that into, into life, um, I started reading the works of a guy named Ken Wilber. Um, I don't know if you've heard of him, but uh, he's a pretty prolific writer. He's been writing about consciousness for um, almost 50 years now. Um, and, and that's really how I got into, like, how do we kind of rethink uh, just the way the world is frameworked? And, and that the, the things that I learned from him just blew my mind and heart open. And that led on to other resources, uh, um, uh, uh, which uh, um, uh, is part of the other things that we're involved with. This notion of uniqueness and the unique self is from a guy named Mark Goffney, who worked with Ken Wilber. And then I would say, um, uh, so, so in terms of like resources, I mean, the two books that probably are ingrained in me the most right now uh, and will always be is, is Mark Goffney's book, Your Unique Self, which he ac- where he actually defines what the unique self is. And then a book that, you know, is not part of the medical world. He talks about medicine in it, but he's an econo- he's a, you know, economist philosopher is Nassim Taleb's Anti-Fragile. I encourage every single person to read those two books. And anti-fragility, which we probably don't have a lot of time to get into, to to have anti-fragility in the healthcare system, I think is crucial. And I think, unfortunately, what we're building thus far is a healthcare system that is not anti-fragile, but fragile. Uh, That's kind of at the macro level. And even at the micro level, like for me, in what I'm doing, I am building my own individual practice to be more anti-fragile so that whatever happens by law or policy or in the healthcare system, it doesn't matter ultimately because I'm able to adapt, which is, which is what an anti-fragile uh, system is able to do. Well, I definitely received those words from my brother. I don't actually hear that direct praise from him a lot, but <laughs> it's appreciated. Uh, and I would echo those, sa- those resources. I would add also in terms of contemporary current Writing, uh, um, you should. Everybody should really look into articles of Dave Chase. He's an entrepreneur. Used to uh, work for Microsoft. Had some several startups that he uh, sold off uh, since, and is in the writes a lot about how the healthcare system can evolve and change. He writes for Forbes, uh, Medium, and LinkedIn, I believe. And he's he has wonderful, wonderful insight as a non physician into where our healthcare system is and where where it should head. And action step wise, I mean, at at our stage, we really envision ourselves as collaborating with these kind of people and creating Health 3.0 type of models or exemplars so that as you guys 
finish your training can come into these systems and improve them even further. Uh, uh, that, that, that's our life's goal right now, to create specific entities, concrete entities that employ all these tenants of Health 3.0, the principles, the structures, so that all the, the newly educated can start coming and advancing those even further. Amazing. And, you know, on a selfish personal level, I'm looking forward to you guys paving away that path <laughs> so uh, I can sneak in and uh, take your work. No, I'm just kidding. But, um, no, it's, it's great uh, that you guys are kind of being at the forefront of this system. And I like, I want to definitely hear more about this anti-fragile um, concept, although I, for the sake of time, I don't know if we can really dig into that too much right now, but hopefully maybe we can wel- welcome you guys on again. Um, I yeah, absolutely. Just, I just mm-hmm. I want you guys to have choices. Like I I, uh, I volunteer teach uh, at my alma mater uh, once a month. I just staff cases there, and you know I see these trainees coming out, and uh, I mean what I see just you know uh, briefly from the outside looking in. I don't know the full details. Is is trainees being kind of molded to serve 2.0? So in effect, they're being molded to be kind of like worker bees. Now, that might be the best thing for somebody coming out. I just want y'all to have choice. So like my brother said, I mean, we want to create uh, systems and entities to where you guys will then see, like, I actually have a conscious choice to do something besides just go into a huge multi-specialty, uh, multidisciplinary practice where I have you know, set hours and set benefits and I'm kind of like an employee. Again, that might work for somebody. But if you don't really want to do that and want to be more creative, you ought to have more choices. And a lot of your guests on the podcast, it's been fun listening to them because they're providing examples for other choices that you guys can consider when you come out. That's a big thing. You know, I'm learning through doing conducting these podcasts and interviewing people is each individual has a very, as you guys have stated, a unique way of expressing their creativity, um, their medical knowledge, and bringing that into the world. And, you know, by listening to each story, my hope is that, you know, students like me and other health professionals, they start to learn options in terms of crafting their life. You know, and and what you guys talk about with Healthcare 3.0, developing this uniqueness in a cultural sense, I'm, I'm really hoping that we can really bring on new forms of creativity in medicine. So I'm just really excited to hear um, where this all goes. Is this all going to change in one month, one year, 10 years? Probably not. But, you know, for us on a global level to keep pushing a little bit, little by little and, you know, changing the cultural voice, I'm really excited for that. Um, and to kind of bring this conversation to close, and I, I hope that we're going to be continuing this at some point because I'm sure we could talk for hours. Um, what is something that you'd like to leave to the listeners for today in terms of this conversation? Maybe a takeaway tip or uh, a main point that they can leave this conversation uh, taking away with them in the wards, in their studies, uh, or in life. You want to go first? Yeah, sure. I, I I wanted to echo what you had said about just identify, keep your creative spirit, always identify inefficiencies in the system where the humanity is not being met in a, in a given encounter and try to improve those things. Because, you know, ultimately, everything, I, a lot of things I think happen from bottom up. So if the system is insane, then all the individuals in that system have to collectively have to enlighten themselves so that the collective system enlightens itself. And I I use a a short definition of, you know, enlightenment really is trying to take away the insanity of something. So if we all do that, whatever role we're in, intern, nurse, practicing at the top of our licenses, then the entire system will eventually get more sane. Uh, That's my biggest takeaway. I mean, just just keep questioning, keep challenging. I mean, do it politely and nicely. uh, But there's always places in medicine that can improve. There's discoveries still yet to be made. Uh, just keep that spirit about you. And when you do feel burned out, then, then you know, go do something that's not medicine. You know, go, go uh, get into, go uh, uh, involve yourself in other people's lives. Find out what they're doing. Now, oftentimes, it's just that brief checkout out of the, the day-to-day of medicine that, you know, gives you that energy back to go back in. So 
That's what that's what kept me going through residency and fellowship. There were a lot of things that I was reading and participating in at a community level and so forth, even in my personal life, that had nothing to do with medicine, and that helped reinvigorate me. If you just focus on medicine and get kind of caught up in there, I think that's where burnout tends to tends to flourish. Well, I'm just going to mend what he said. I mean, it, it in one respect, it had nothing to do with medicine, but in another respect, it had everything to do with medicine. Right, and so uh, you know, when you said Taylor about culture, I mean, you were so right on on that. It's, this is really about a cultural shift, and I, the thing that I would say is that you know, cultural shifts don't sometimes can happen pretty quick. It's just a critical mass that has to occur. I mean, the '60s as a culture transformed the world in a relatively short period of time, and with the power of the internet and connectivity, cultural shifts are a lot more likely to shift things pretty quick. And so I guess what I will end with is to just to say that, uh, and this is just from our mentor, uh, we live in an intimate universe. I mean, the, 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 universe, the, uni- the universe is a love story. And uh, these stories that we play out and enact as unique individuals with the people that we connect with, these are, these are crucial. They are, they are crucial uh, to the evolution of what it is that we do and who it is that we are. And so to actually kind of celebrate that as we go through training that is albeit tough, if we can do that and have that be in us uh, and practice that as a skill, we we can transform anything. And your generation, I would say, is probably the most instinctively equipped to be able to make that happen. Wow. Wow. Well, thank you so much um, for those very kind words. And uh, I hope that for those listening, you really take in what Venu and Vinay are saying in this conversation. They're not just uh, practicing physicians, but they are philosophers. They are learners. um, They're voracious readers. And they're bestowing onto us some really great wisdom. And I hope that we can uh, bring about a bigger creative spirit in the work that we do and find solutions and take away the insanity. Uh, I, I really love a lot of the points in this conversation. So guys, please listen in and I hope you enjoyed this episode. Guys, thank you so much for being on today. Thank you, Taylor. Thanks, Taylor. Thanks for inviting us. We enjoyed it. Hey guys, we hope you enjoyed this episode and we want you to definitely subscribe to our social media channels. Check out The Happy Doc on Facebook, iTunes, Twitter, and Instagram. Please like, subscribe, share, and send us feedback. And please check out the website www.thehappydoc.com. Again, we hope you enjoyed The Happy Doc, the voice of fulfilled physicians. Peace out.